Like the office they commemorate, presidential libraries are living institutions. Certainly it is my hope that the Reagan Library will become a dynamic intellectual forum where scholars interpret the past and policymakers debate the future. Welcome to the Ronald Reagan Presidential Foundation and Institute's virtual event series. To fulfill President Reagan's mission of making the Reagan Library a dynamic intellectual forum, our Center for Public Affairs Programming offers lectures and forums presenting perspectives on important public policy issues of the day. Each year, we bring you 20 to 30 events from politicians, authors, members of the media, business and military leaders, and more. Since the March 2020 closure of many businesses across our great country, the Reagan Foundation is now bringing its events online to ensure that we are still delivering world-class content, even if you can't get to our hilltop to watch it in person. In this week's Center for Public Affairs virtual event, we invite you to join us for a playback from last month's Reagan Institute Summit on Education's keynote discussion with Secretary of Education Betsy DeVos and Ian Rowe. Secretary DeVos also joined us last year at our Education Summit, and it was an honor to have her with us again. Betsy DeVos serves as the 11th U.S. Secretary of Education. She was confirmed by the U.S. Senate on February 7, 2017, after being nominated by President Donald Trump. Ian Rowe is a resident fellow, Domestic Policy Studies at American Enterprise Institute. During the conversation, Secretary DeVos discusses the importance of our Constitution, the new ways of learning in our current COVID pandemic, and what federal and local governments can do to advance civics curriculum in the classrooms. We now invite you to enjoy our virtual program with Secretary Betsy DeVos and Mr. Ian Rowe. Secretary DeVos, how are you? I'm very well, Ian. It's so good to see you again. So great to see you. How are you doing? It's great to be here together in person. Yes, I was, I was, uh, when I was first asked to do this, I thought, oh, it'd be not so great to be by video. So thank you for uh, taking the time to be together. Well, thank you. It's an honor. So this is Constitution Day. Um, What does that mean to you as the Secretary of Education for what students and teachers should be engaged in throughout the country today? Well, it's a very good day to be reminded of what the founding of America really means and um, to really consider the, um, you know, the, the things on which our founders uh, really put this American experiment together and literally changed the course of history. I think about uh, you know, my grandparents and great-grandparents that came to this country for economic opportunity and religious freedom. And I think about the many ways also that we have sort of forgotten about the importance of the Constitution and our founding documents. And it's a really good time to refocus and pay attention again to what they really mean and what they mean for our future. Fantastic. And throughout the country today, you know, we're in the we're uh, late September or uh, mid to late September. Schools are opening all across the country in ways that we have never seen before. There's there's all virtual. Uh, there's hybrid. Uh, even in the network of schools that I uh, used to lead in New York, 55% of the parents said they want to uh, learn virtually. What, what's your view on what's happening around the country? And is there any federal guidance that uh, schools should be operating on now in terms of opening? Well, let me just comment first to the things that we've done from the federal level to help schools to be able to make the decisions on how they reopen. Uh, Immediately when uh, we had the shutdown, uh, we extended as much flexibility and autonomy to the states and local districts as possible under the law. And we immediately got distributed all of the CARES funds. There were about $30 billion appropriated for education and uh, gave the schools the flexibility flexibility around their current year funding as well so that they could immediately use those resources to do what they needed to do on behalf of students, whether it be cleaning supplies yeah, or personal, personal protection equipment mm-hmm. or um, you know technology. Uh, we know that for many, that's been a big challenge. And so we have continued to uh, help support that that work, that effort, and then also have continued with a whole of government approach, frankly, uh, with the coronavirus task force, with um, with uh, all of the recommendations and the continued updated information from the CDC and the NIH. Uh, all of those things, uh, the tools that educators really need to be able to make decisions 
how best to reopen schools for kids. Sure. And are you seeing any best practices across the country, any particular districts that are standing out in terms of how they're managing these challenges? Well, I'm sure there are many, uh, but I had the opportunity to visit one recently in Georgia. I think they did a really good job. It was in Forsyth County, and they did a good job of reaching out to all of their constituents, the families, the students, all of the faculty, the, the teachers, and worked together to come up with solutions on how they were going to reopen, offering families a range of options. So the students there, about, I think, three quarters of them were back to school in person, and oh, the balance was working remotely. And some of the those that were working remotely also had some classes that maybe it was a lab that they would come in for. And um, they were having great success. Uh, they were well underway in their you know second or third week, I believe. Um, and they were a good example, I think, of what uh, leaders can and should do to really engage all of their customers or their constituents in that decision-making process. I, I've been, frankly, um, disappointed in places where they have not given families the input and the option to choose what's best for their families. Uh, we know that for so many kids, being together in person in a classroom with peers and with their teachers is really an imperative for their own health, for a lot of other measures sure. of social health. emotional impacts, absolutely. And, um, and, and all too many students across the country are starting school without that option today. Are there any incentives that you're creating to encourage schools to start in that way and provide those kinds of options? Well, it's really a matter of state policy primarily, but uh, clearly uh, the president and I have talked about the necessity to offer this as an option, an important option, and um, we'll continue to do so. I think Congress is considering ways that they might financially incentivize and or reward uh, those who are uh, actually providing in-person mm -hmm. instruction. But um, I think if, if nothing else, the last several months has really laid bare um, the fact that our K-12 education approach has been pretty static for a lot of years, and it isn't able to pivot very quickly in many cases. And, uh, and parents are finding themselves frustrated or sort of left high and dry in places that are not really addressing the immediate needs of students. And I worry very much about those who are the most vulnerable. Absolutely. Um, you know, students with uh, disabilities who are not receiving the kind of services that they need. And frankly, I've heard uh, from more than one parent who are um, just heartbroken over the way that their child has regressed just in the last few months. And uh, so this is, this is really an opportune time for uh, leaders to think differently about what we need to do to ensure that all students have the kind of access they need to get their education the way that works for them. Sure. You mentioned the CARES Act and there were critical funds in that particular piece of legislation. Where do things stand now with the HEROES Act, the HEALS Act? What, what, what's, first of all, what are the provisions in there that you're most hopeful for as it relates to education? And what do we need to do to get it across the finish line? Well, as, as you probably know, the Senate last week considered a bill uh, that didn't make it through uh, the full mm -hmm. Senate uh, because of their procedures. But um, for the first time in recent history, well, since the Washington Opportunity Scholarship Program, uh, more than half the Senate voted in favor of a package that included a very significant school choice provision. It would have uh, provided, it will provide, and I'm, I'm very hopeful that it will continue to yeah. get considered, but it will provide uh, emergency funding for schools, small, private, mainly faith-based schools across the country. We know there's over 150 Catholic schools so far that have said they can't continue to operate because of the economic impacts of the virus. It will provide Im immediate funding for students attending those schools and allow for families to be able to continue to make that choice if they've been economically impacted. And then it would establish a, a tax credit at the federal level that states could choose to participate in to expand school choice 
education freedom options in all of the states that chose to participate. So importantly, we hear a lot about today the um, you know families that are putting together Their homeschool consor consortiums or learning pods or uh, you know some new combination of of uh, those approaches, and it would allow for uh, families to be able to get resources to access those kinds of opportunities, and importantly, families that can't afford to make those decisions today. You've been a, you and the president have been a huge champion of choice on the part of parents. So how would that work? So if I, so there, as you mentioned, there are many families who for a number of reasons have just said they feel more comfortable educating their students, their, ch their own children at home or micro schools or pods. Is it possible that in the near future, uh, parents would be able to get those resources that otherwise they'd be taxed, but get that money back for their own education? Well, I think it is very possible. Uh, the biggest thing standing in the way, frankly, are the teachers' unions that have really uh, dug in their heels and it continued to insist that um, members of a certain party uh, toe the line and continue to protect the status quo. And um, we see this across the country. Um, but we know that more than ever before, parents are aware of their children's educational experience. They saw they've got a front row seat. They now. saw, you know, through the spring how well their particular school did with pivoting to online or remote instruction. They're also experiencing now how their schools are doing with actually meeting their needs. And I think there's a, an awakening to this notion that we can't have a one-size-fits-all approach. And more and more parents, I believe, are going to continue to insist that they have the, ch the opportunity to make the choice that's right for their children. And that is, uh, it, at, at its core, a, a justice issue, frankly, for all families. And so I, I am, I've, I'm always the optimist, but I'm even more optimistic today that the demand for this is going to continue to grow. And I, I firmly believe that there are a lot of teachers who know this to be the right thing for them and their students as well. Frankly, giving families more choices and more freedom to make those choices will bring forth more opportunities for, for teachers to uh, teach in an environment it, that is right for them and uh, that they are really energized by as well. So you might say, so, so to those who say more choice could mean more inequity, how would you address that, how would you address that, that, that concern? I actually think it will be more equitable if families have the resources that are designated, that are already being spent on their children, though through a system or through a building, if those resources were attached to that child, and I like to use the mental image of a backpack, you know, every kid has some kind of a backpack going to school. Um, if the resources for that child follow in that child's backpack, to wherever the parents decide is going to be the best place for them, uh, it, it is going to bring more opportunity, more equity, more uh, and more, and frankly, more innovation. And it's going to meet more kids' needs. It's going to meet more kids where they are. Uh, I mean, I think about today uh, hearing from students who say, "I'm, you know, by the time they're in fifth grade, how bored they are of school." Um, that doesn't. It doesn't need to be that way. And so it, it is a ripe time for that kind of change and innovation, but through empowering families to make those right choices for their kids. I mean, we hear about the, the uh, dramatic increase in uh, homeschooling and yes. those who want to homeschool. Well, if you have additional resources to be able to you can do either, uh, you know, what, whatever your particular family's need is, whether you need to, um, you need to be able to stay home to do it yourself for your child, to have resources to support that, or to help with a, a consortium hiring a of tutor, families, yes, hiring right. a tutor, um, you know, you name it, you would be able to really help uh, guide your child's future in a much more um, hands-on and intentional way. And so do you think that potentially could happen this year? Uh, 
I'm very optimistic that uh, it, when the Congress comes back to uh, consider a package, that this pr provision will be part of that. And, um, and of course, President Trump will sign that in a heartbeat. Yeah, in a heartbeat. Wow, fantastic. Well, as you mentioned, uh, it's a Constitution Day and a reminder of the importance of understanding American history, the rights and responsibilities of all of our citizens. And yet there's a lot of debate in the country right now of potentially reframing American history, looking back on the things like the legacy of slavery. When you think about what kids should be learning about this idea of American exceptionalism, what do you think about that? What does that mean? Well, America is an exceptional country, and we know this because there are literally millions of people the world around who want to come here, who want to be a part of the American idea. And yet, I think there are uh, a lot of uh, young people, you know, my even my children's generation and younger, that um, probably have not been exposed to our history in a way that helps them really appreciate from whence we came and the, uh, the need to protect what we have, to build on what we have, to acknowledge uh, where we have to continue to improve, but not to forget you know, what, our, what our foundations are. And um, I, I'm, I'm very uh, optimistic with some of the refocus on the need for uh, more civics instruction, for more intentional instruction in history. Uh, you know, we, we test a lot. We test mm -hmm. a lot of mathematics and reading. But not history. But we don't, uh, we don't really gauge where and how uh, students are doing in their knowledge of history. In fact, there is a every few years NAEP test that mm -hmm. um, the most recent one this year, in end of last year, as a matter of fact, really showed us some very, um, very discouraging data. Uh, I believe over half of the students had no idea what the Lincoln-Douglas debates were, for example and what the significance of those debates were for our country and our country's history. And when you have that level of uh, ignorance or lack of understanding, um, it doesn't bode well for our future. So uh, I, I really am excited about some of the things that you've been involved with, with the 1776 Project. And yes. uh, would love to have you comment more about that. I know we're, we're having a conversation, yeah, yeah. so let's do that. Yeah, well, no, I'm very excited. I'm part of a consortium uh, of, of uh, a wide range of intellectual scholars, local activists, uh, led by uh, Bob Woodson, a leader uh, for the last 40 years, helping thousands of people across the country essentially become agents of their own uplift. And when we saw uh, the New York Times launch the 1619 Project and curriculum, which uh, frames America in such a way that it says the founding ideals were false when they were written, we thought that that's, that's not uh, the interpretation for many who live in this country. And so we've created a new curriculum. It's called the 1776 Unites Curriculum. It will feature largely unknown uh, African Americans, uh, past and present, who embraced the ideals of free enterprise and faith and family and hard work as a way to be agents of their own uplift, to go from persecution to prosperity. And it's a much more aspirational view of, of the opportunities that exist in this country. And we think it's very important that young people get a sense of the legacy of excellence yeah. that exists in this country. I think that sounds really wonderful. And, you know, I'm often asked, uh, shouldn't the federal government um, advance some kind of a national civics curriculum? Uh, I, I fear doing that, frankly. Uh, the federal government, the Department of Education, does not have a role in a national curriculum. Curriculum is best left to the states and, and uh, local you know, local uh, districts and at local education agencies. But um, we can talk about curriculum that actually honors and respects our history and embraces all of the parts of our history and continues to build on that because we, we know that if, uh, 
if we do not know and understand history, we are bound to repeat it. And um, we're bound to repeat the bad parts of history as well as perhaps the good parts. But um, I, I'm, I'm thrilled to hear about uh, your involvement with the 1776 project and or 70, 1776 unites. Yes, it's yes. Right. The, the, the second word is very important. Because, it is. Because the idea is to recognize that these fundamentals around hard work, resiliency, optimism, those are available to every young person in the country. These are not things that we have to be divided on. This is what unites us as a country. This is what makes America uniquely America. So we have gone through this very tough moment uh, in our country, but hopefully there are opportunities for innovation. Are there any things that you've seen that have come out of this COVID period in terms of distance learning or new kinds of instruction, professional development that you think, again, are worthy of mention? Well, I think there's a host of them, and I'm sure there are many that I'm not even aware of, but I think um, in in a crisis that is also probably the best moment for creation and ingenuity to come through. And I think that uh, we've seen um, educators really rise to the occasion in many in many places and in many ways. We've also seen parents who didn't consider themselves to be educators <laughs> right. uh, really doing things yep. differently and uh, and trying new things that they actually are finding to be quite successful. And I I just think about the anecdote of a, um, a father of four in Texas who. Uh, thought it would be interesting early on in the uh, shutdown to interview um, just people he knew through the course of his work and neighbors and so forth and have them just come and talk about what their job was and what it took to get to do their job, what their education was, what their experience was, and just talk about it. And I think what a, what a benefit for and, and, and uh, reportedly tens of thousands of uh, you know families students came and 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 watched uh, these interviews, but um, what uh, what a benefit for young kids um, and and I've been an advocate for kids as early as middle school to really get a broader understanding Absolutely. of what possibilities are out there in the world. Uh, to expose them to that in in a, a new and different way, and uh, I think uh, again, I think that this moment is going to really bring forward a lot of real uh, creative solutions to a lot of intransigent problems and or issues educationally, and I'm I'm optimistic that it's also going to result longer term in uh, K twelve education looking very different for a. Yes, for a for a you know a, a big percentage of of students. This summer, I was part of a, a team of people who created a very innovative approach to distance learning, where we had some of the best teachers in the country, only about fourteen of them, working with about five hundred partner teachers, teaching twelve thousand kids in seventeen states. It was just a very interesting way to leverage your top talent. Because once you lose the four walls of a classroom, suddenly you can take your best teachers and reach thousands exactly. of kids. Exactly. So are there any, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, what do you think are the innovations that will remain, that, that will survive this, this time? Well, I think a, a much more um, robust use of technology in a positive way, too, as you've uh, just mentioned, to really leverage great teaching, uh, to leverage, uh, you know, uh, different kinds of experiences in, in uh, different ways that we haven't yet thought about. Yeah. And, um, and I think, uh, I also am optimistic that as Families, some families, depending on where you live, experience the out of doors in a whole new way. I think we're going to see learning look differently for um, some kids that really do well out in nature and um, and you know experience their learning mm -hmm. in more robust ways that yep. way. Yep. Um, we talked a little bit about teachers' unions. How would you how would you say we can best support teachers? I think giving, first of all, giving teachers the honor and respect that 
great teachers need and deserve. I feel as though their profession has been in many ways deprofessionalized. And I, I, I think it is primarily the result of being in a system that uh, um, really forces uh, mediocrity across the board or doesn't recognize merit in a way mm. it should. And, um, and I, I, I think about a roundtable that I had a couple of years ago where it was made up of teachers who had been either teachers of the year in their state or their district, and they'd done their victory lap. You know, they've got, they'd gone and made all of their um, speeches to all of their, their uh, neighboring districts or, or where, whatever the, you know, the setting was, and had come back after that year into the classroom and, um, and, and to a person, the ones I talked with, they had ultimately left the classroom, something they loved better than, more than anything else, primarily because they were sort of put back in the box. You know, they, they had done their thing and the message they clearly received was, okay, you've done, you, you've had your victory lap. Now you need to come back and just, uh, you know, get in line. And, and, and I, I think that's tragic. I mean, there are so many great, talented teachers who never get to shine because uh, they're not allowed to do so because of peer pressure or whatever, you know, whatever the environment may be, uh, negative environment in their, in their uh, particular building. Um, but where there, is, where there is good leadership, where there is opportunity to really um, uh, you know, show the, the, for merit to, to, to win. Um, th- those teachers are the ones that we need to continue to, Uplift. um, support and give more opportunity to. And so I think we do that. And we've, we've had a, a proposal to give teachers, um, professional development latitude so that they can take the resources and choose what's right for them to help them personally develop instead of uh, checking a box, as many of the professional development exercises are, I've, I've heard. Yeah. Um, and, and I think, uh, again, a, a real marketplace for K-12 education would result in uh, more compensation, ultimately, for teachers as well. Um, you know, the amount of uh, the resources that actually reach the classroom and the teacher is negligible compared to what we invest in yep. in the um, in the whole thing. Yep. And I think this is my final question. So we're obviously in the midst of an election year. No matter what happens post-election, what do you think should be the top priority for the Federal Department of Education? Well, the top priority for the Federal Department of Education should be to get out of the way of the state and local um, departments and, and state and local communities as much as possible. I, I happen to be one who thinks that the federal role in education, um, first of all, it wasn't part of the Constitution. It wasn't. There's no mention of education in the Constitution or our founding documents. And I think that uh, while laudable in its creation, it has not lived up to the goal of closing the achievement gap. In fact, in many ways, it's exacerbated it, I believe. And so my, my belief is the Federal Department of Education should have a much smaller role and should have a much smaller footprint. Uh, there are certain federal laws, of course, that need to be uh, you know, f- followed, respected, Office for Civil Rights, um, IDEA. But there are many areas that the Federal Department of Education has overstepped its bounds and has, uh, I think, created a dynamic that is not particularly helpful or beneficial for those laboratories of democracy at the state level. Okay. Well, Secretary DeVos, thank you. Any final parting words you'd like to share with the, with the group? Well, I just appreciate the opportunity to be here today and talk about uh, the importance of education and um, and and what this moment can mean for the future of students, no matter their age. Uh, we've talked primarily about K twelve education, but um, you know we are investing in the future of our nation, and it's I think one of the most fundamental things we can possibly do, and, and that we need to be really um, really intentional about. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks, Ian. We hope this conversation has inspired you to share what you've learned with your family and friends. 
and that you'll join us again for an upcoming event. And let me offer lesson number one about America. All great change in America begins at the dinner table. So tomorrow night in the kitchen, I hope the talking begins. And children, if your parents haven't been teaching you what it means to be an American, let them know and nail them on it. That would be a very American thing to do.